God has given his people a tremendous task in this world and all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Testimonies to Ministers 118. And in Great Controversy 606 we read, The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority. The inroads of spiritualism. The stealthy but rapid progress of papal power. All will be unmasked. And by these thousands who have never heard words like these before will be stirred. In the ancient world, the ancient system of pagan idolatry gave place to the monstrous cathedrals that exist in Europe today. But still on these cathedrals, we see remnants of the origin of this system. Spain reached a tremendous climax during the 15th and 16th century in her colonies around the world. And we see in Spain the great power of the Catholic Church. It was in Spain that the Inquisition was set up with a tremendous power. 68 million people were destroyed there alone. The early Christians had spent many years suffering at the hands of persecution and as the church became corrupt, they separated. We find in the history of the Wallenses by Wiley and the Wallenses by Claudiana, a book written in Rome, that the early Christians who wanted to stay pure and stay faithful to the apostolic faith removed themselves into the mountains and the remote areas of Europe and there they raised their families. But even there the armies of Rome found them. The church was now the destroyer and some of the most horrible scenes in the history of the world took place at that time. These people tried to have religious freedom. They worshipped in groves and trees and in caves of the earth but even there the long arm of Rome found them. Their valleys were fairly silent just before the time of Martin Luther. But when they heard of the great reformation that was taking place in Germany and in Switzerland, they sent representatives and they joined the reformation and a tremendous movement took place against the power of Rome. And so Satan moved. In Great Controversy 2.34 we read, At this time the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affections, reason and conscious holy silence. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be developed to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, but under the blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. In the power of the Jesuits by Philip Miller and this book, The Jesuit, their spiritual doctrine and practice, we get a, 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 a history of the Jesuit order. We find that Inigo, the father of the order, was born in the Valley of Loyola, Loyola in northern Spain. Here he was born to a wealthy family. There today is a tremendous monastery to the Jesuits and a magnificent chapel illustrating how much they honored this man and the wealth of that order. The castle next to it is where Ignatius was born. Ignatius, as a young man, was a violent, brutish sort. The police records of the day said violent, vindictive, and dangerous. He was a proud young man and involved himself in many of the sins and evils of the day. He wanted to be a great commander. But unfortunately, in a, a battle with the French in Pamplona, he shattered his leg. And now his plans for the future as a great warrior were ended. There, while he was recuperating, he read books about the saints and about Jesus. These were fanciful bo books about the saints, about the miracles and the things they could do. He envisioned Christ as a great commander. And now he, as a saint, would capture the world for Jesus Christ. He had had a nervous breakdown, and this concept illustrated the condition that his mind was in. Now, as a cripple, he made his way all the way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat. There was an ancient sanctuary there, and in that sanctuary was ha housed a very sacred image to the Catholic Church. This image was called the Black Virgin of Montserrat. 
In this church, Ignatius spent three days making confession and spent an entire night standing before this virgin statue as a, a knight in a vigil. He committed himself to the baby, Jesus, and to Mary. And from there he determined to go to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem he determined that he would conquer the Muslim world for Jesus Christ. All the powers of Rome couldn't do it and now he would do it. On his way, he found he couldn't go because Barcelona had the plague. And so he had to stay in this little town called Monresa for ten months. There in that town, as we arrived there, we found a monstrous institution of the Jesuits built over the place where Ignatius stayed there. It was a cave. Ten months in the cave, he tortured his body and his mind until, in exhaustion, he began to have dreams and visions. He claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him in this place. In his eye, he saw lights flashing. And he believed that Mary came in the form of a light in Jesus. And he believed that he saw Satan in a spiral of light eyes before him. He believed that he had chased Satan around like a dog with a stick and many other fanciful concepts, but he claimed that these teachings he received there were the foundation of his entire movement. And here he began the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. These were... Uh, experiences that a master Jesuit would bring novices through, would bring other people through to give them the same kind of mind that, that Ignatius developed through his experience. They were brought uh, through these experiences just like music on a sheet. For 30 days they were told what to think, how to feel, when to groan and when to sigh, what to imagine, and they were to cut off all normal human emotion throughout those experiences. Ignatius finally made his way to Jerusalem, but there the Franciscan monks told, him to, monks told him to go home. We don't want any political trouble here in the Muslim Empire. We've had enough of that. So making his way back to the port of Barcelona, Ignatius sat with little children learning the rudiments of Latin in order to study. From there he made his way to the little college in the town of Alcala, north of Madrid. Here at the Colegio Mayor, he began his studies in theology. While he was there, he gathered a little group of, of men and women around him and began to bring them through his mental exercises. They would faint and fall aside. They would scream and pass out. Friends, this is demonic activity that this man was involved in, even in his early history. Ignatius was known for the rest of his life for his mystic powers. In Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough and Secret Societies of All Ages by Hecathorn, we learned that at the time there was an organization called the Alumbrado or the Illuminati in Spain. The Inquisition determined that Ignatius had been a member of this occult intellectual society and threw him in the jail there at the Inquisition. Upon his release, he made his way to Salamanca, to the great university there, but again he was brought under suspicion of being an Illuminist and he was thrown in the Inquisition again. Now, upon being released, he made his way to the great University of Paris in France, and there he gathered intelligent young men around him, brought them under the control of the power of his mind, and these became the basis of his society. Not too far from the university, they dedicated themselves to the new order of the Jesuits there in Montmartre. Today, there's a tremendous chapel on Montmartre, one of the most magnificent chapels that we saw while we were in Europe. And it's dedicated to the destruction of democracy and liberty in the world. Ignatius from there made his way to Rome. And in time, he was accepted by the Pope. The Reformation had destroyed the influence of the church in many parts of Europe. In the book, The Ignatian Fireworks or Fiery Jesuits, published in 1667, it's right here in the vaults at PUC if you want to read it, we read the aged gentleman, Paul III, who then sat in the infallible chair, foreseeing the need, of, need the papacy had of incendiaries to vex the enemies to its grandeur, easily grants the petition of Ignatius and his disimmures prostrate at His Holiness's feet, where after sweet kisses and token of their obedience, they receive an institution of their predominant sect. From that time, Rome was the center of this new satanic system, the Jesuit order. This is the Chiesa del Gesù in Rome, and entering into it, we get some idea of the wealth and the power of the society.
of Jesus. There, a death mask of Loyola was made into a picture. We get a view of what he looked like. But the altars and the artwork are the ancient Baroque style, and it's a magnificent structure showing that the wealth of the nations at one time flowed into this order. There's an allegorical statue of the church destroying Huss and Luther. Another great painting of Ignatius ascending to heaven as a saint after his death. But the most interesting of all to me was this, of Jesus holding his heart out in his hand. It was the, the uh, followers of Ignatians that brought into the church the mystical teachings and the worship of Mary in the heart and brought those mystical teachings of the Dark Ages into the 20th century. When Xavier, ex, when Xavier was once requested by one of the patients to scrape out an abscess, this is Xavier, one of, uh, one of Ignatius' followers, he felt rather squeamish about it. He put his hand, which was covered with a purulent matter, to his mouth in order to put his self-control to the extreme test. It's amazing that even at that early time, these men had minds that controlled their emotions. Rodriguez would not at first make use of this resting place, but afterwards, in order to punish himself for his weakness, he laid himself down naked in a bed in which immediately before a man had died of pediculosis and which still swarmed with vermin. These men, with their mind over the control of their emotions, were sent out into the world. At first, they proved themselves in the hospitals, and that's where these quotations came from in Philip Miller's book, History of the Jesuits. But they also made their way out into the world of the pagans to win them to the new pagan Christianity. One of the first was St. Francis Xavier. The Pope claimed that this man had been given the gift of tongues, and as he went out, he certainly learned scores and scores of languages in India and in Asia and Japan and became a master of that whole province in the Jesuit system. The Jesuits were given tremendous power. At first, there was only 60 of them allowed, but in time, they were given full control of the church. Yea, they were given power to excommunicate all who would hinder or do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach, administer sacraments, to change their general, to, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgence, to live exempt, free from secular power, taxes, as well as juris jurisdiction, authority, sentence, and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge, magistrate, from any search. Folks, it illustrates that the church and society gave the Jesuit absolute control in this world total free from all law. In the Council of Trent, two of them were set aside, Alcazar and Ribera, to form a counterfeit theology to the prophecy of the Protestants about the Antichrist. At that time, these theologians formed the idea of futurism, that the Antichrist should come sometime in the future. This in time developed through Don, John Darby and Edward Irving in Scotland into the rapture concept. And this book on the rapture was written by two Catholic priests. Peter Canisus and Peter Faber were the first missionaries sent in to form an educational system in Germany to counter the Reformation. The Jesuits became the educators and the controllers of the mind of children and the generations that were coming up. They became the great moral theologians and fought the Protestant concept of predestination. They taught free will, but merged with their free will was the idea that an individual through his own works could become perfect and gain merit on his own. Father Matteo Ricci illustrates the tremendous power of the Jesuit to infiltrate other religions and cultures. He became in every way a Chinese and in time infiltrated the court of the emperor in China. These Jesuits could read and learn the language and the religion better than the people, become the teachers of the people, and then insinuate Roman Catholicism, eventually opening up these magnificent courts to the Catholic missionaries. They entered into the primitive and poor areas of the world, and thousands of pagans were gathered into the Catholic Church through these men. But they had a secret way of doing it. In the book Fire of Jesuits, we read, they allowed their proselyte Christians to commit idolatry by a subtle evasion that of enjoining themselves 
enjoining them to hide under their cloaks an image of Jesus Christ, to which they teach them by mental reservation to direct those public adorations which they rendered to the idol. The Jesuits infiltrated the other orders. They took over the head and the control of the Inquisition from the Dominicans. They turned it into a tremendous engine, a terrible power that wiped out thousands and millions of people. In Gary's doctrines of the Jesuits, we read it was Loyola himself who procured the erection of the Inquisition in Portugal. It was at the hands of the Jesuits that millions of people suffered the most horrible deaths, terrible suffering that goes beyond our imagination today. But these people did not realize that as they were persecuting these people, as they were torturing their flesh and causing every nerve in the body to scream in pain, they were causing the sufferings of Jesus Christ himself in his people. In Fox's Book of Martyrs and other books, it tells about the tremendous campaigns that raged against those who had fled into the mountains to have religious freedom. In time, all of the Albigensian race in southern Fran France were completely genocide exterminated from the earth. Not one was left. And the Walden Seas in northern Italy were exterminated to the place where there was only a few thousand left. And they had made their way over the Alps to Geneva. The record of history has been rewritten, folks, by the Roman Catholic religion. The Jesuits became the controllers of history. And thus, the record of millions of faithful souls is not available to us. The spirit of prophecy tells us that that record is written in heaven. The church, every time she wanted to evangelize or infiltrate another area of the world, set up schools or colleges there in Rome. This became the origin of the Pontifical Gregorian University. Its purpose is for, for the subversion of the world. They sent up houses of the Jesuits and magnificent schools which gave some indication of the tremendous wealth of this order. Europe was being covered by the Jesuits. In the Ignatian fireworks we read, or we notice on the back page it shows the Pope heating the fire that burned London in the 17th century. And it shows Jesuits under the control of the Pope starting fires in every country of the world. These Jesuits believed diabolical and witchcraft doctrines. At the heart of that order was occult teaching. From a Jesuit creed by John Battista Poza, he says, I believe in two gods, one is son, father, and mother, metaphorically, according to a temporal generation. The other, metaphorically, mother and father, according to a temporal generation. And what is consequent here, too, that the common term mother, father, may be equally attributed to God and the Blessed Virgin, as if they were both hermaphrodites, sexually male and female. This is raw pagan teaching in the raw sense of the word. In the book, again, the fiery Jesuits, they uh, affirm that the diligence of an expert conjurer in diabolical arts may well be thought worthy of a reward, and that a fortune teller is not obliged to restitution if he hath consulted the devil, nor to confession, though he hath expressly invoked the devil, and that it is lawful to consult a conjurer. It was the Jesuits who became the masters of astrology in the Dark Ages. They led out in the schools of teaching astrology in the Vatican. Folks, this chart was made by a famous Jesuit kircher, and it's astrological healing. In the Soul Husters by Rennie Norbergen, an illustration that their teachings on astrology and their occult beliefs in the heart of that system has never changed. Rennie Norbergen in this book quotes Jean Dixon as saying, As a child I was taught Chaldean astrology by a wise and wonderful man, a Jesuit priest. I don't see how anything can be... Uh, I don't th see how anyone can say that astrology is wrong. After all, he was a man of God. Gene Dixon in the world is one of the most popular clairvoyants and astrologers today. And we understand now that she was taught that by the Jesuits. In Gurry's Doctrine of the Jesuits, this also is available in the library here at PUC, we learn the secret of how the Jesuits became the masters of the confessional. They could excuse sin by subtle evasion. And because of it, the wealthy powers of the earth beat a path to the Jesuit confessional. They learned the secrets of state. They sent this to the head of their order and through it they were able to manipulate the emperors and the rulers of the world. Henry IV the, the Henry the had them in his kingdom. And we find that, uh, <clears throat> that the Lewises surrounded themselves with Jesuit and used them as confessors and to run their government. But this Lewis 
the 15th, was a homosexual. No wonder he needed a Jesuit confessor. As we were going through Versailles, we were told that in this room, this was the bed of Louis, and as the heads of state came in each morning to talk over state matters, he would grab one of them, pull them in bed, and pull a curtain around him, and after sodomy was over, they would continue the state talks. And his confessor, his confessor was a Jesuit. The Jesuits got used to the wealth of the world. They lived in luxurious palaces like this, being confessors to the priests and kings, and they became the wealthiest group in the world. Through their influence in France, one of the most horrible massacres that took place in history took place. Publicly, the church appeared to be uniting with the Protestants, just as they are today, friends. And secretly, they planned the slaughter in 1572, where 25,000 Huguenots alone were slaughtered in Paris and over 65,000 throughout France. Because of this, the governments recognized the danger of the Jesuit order, and they began to be expulsed from various countries of this world. They were kicked out of Paris. They were kicked out of Portugal, where they had gained tremendous power. They were removed from Spain. The governments realized that the wars and the troubles were being caused by the Jesuits. And now the Jesuit order went through all the terrors of the Inquisition. It was at this time in history that the Jesuits were taken and they were thrown in prison. They were thrown on ships and forced to stay on these ships without toilet facilities until disease destroyed their bodies and racked their souls. The Jesuit order's power, the secret of its power, is in its structure. One man stands as all-powerful at the head of it. The provincial is a man that is all-powerful within his area, submitting to the general, and then the superiors are in control of the Jesuit individuals. But at any time, they can go around their superiors to the one above him, keeping a check and balance situation. The local yokel individual Jesuit is part of an elaborate system of espionage. And they report on each other, too, keeping a balance. They report to their superiors, who in turn report weekly to the provincial. Tremendous bodies of knowledge go into the provincial from all over their provinces. The provincials give a summary report monthly to the general, but superiors can go around their provincial, and thus a check and balance is kept all the way to the top. Even the general himself is subject to a council of six elected by the general congregation. Four are elected from four different countries. One as an advisor and a military commander, and the other is the general's confessor. One of the, or the other of the latter two must be with him at all times. Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough, page 309 and 310. This man has held more power in this world than any other human being alive. Gurry's doctrine the Jesuits will read, the general has usually stood towards the Pope much as a powerful grand feudatory lord of the Middle Ages did towards a weak titular Lord Paramount, or perhaps as a captain of a splendid host of free champions, as he did towards a potentate with whom the, he chose to take temporary and precarious service. And the shrewd Roman populace have long shown their recognition of this fact by styling these two great personages the White Pope and the black pope. In truth, the society has never from the very first obeyed the pope whenever its will and his happen to run counter to each other. In the book, The Fire of Jesus, we read about the power again. Jesuit power arrived to such an height that when the Italian di Acquaviva came to be father general, he gave his hand to be kissed as the pope is toe. In their constitution, the father general is called Dei Legatus or Christi Vicarius one of which, having the title, regarded not the Pope's message, though sent to him by two cardinals, enjoining everyone in the society to acknowledge Christ present in their general. The Jesuits tell us, our Father General, as all know, governs Rome itself and the Popedom. We make war at our pleasure between one prince and another, between a prince and his subjects, who serve dominion over cities and countries, fearing no discovery of our actions, since our commerce is chiefly with great men. We know every public secret and can, in a singular way, dispatch heretics and enemies of the Roman court. The view of Ignatius is so great 
that in uh, the book Fire Jesuits we read that in the University of Krakow in 1627 Ignatius is portrayed as holding the world in his hands and fire streaming forth from his heart with his motto I came to send fire into the world and look at this blasphemy from a sermon by F. D. F. Doza, J.S., quoted in the Fiery Jesuits, In these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, Ignatius, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. What do these people believe about Ignatius anyway? The grand rule of the order is that an inferior readily to declare his assent and consent to a superior and active obedience when he says the snow is black or the crow is white. To yield perfect, absolute, and unlimited obedience to him they call Christ's vicar. By the abdication of their own will and judgment, they are the staff in the old man's hands. We should always be ready to accept this principle. I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church defines it. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius here, page 141. This is the order of induction in the Jesuit system. First, those studying to enter the order, the novices. Then the scholastics, the great teachers, the temporal ruling over the houses and the schools, and the coadjutors, finally, the agents that carry out the responsibility of aiding in the world projects. Then, and only then, this mass of Jesuits can be initiated into the actual order of the Jesuits, the profess of the three vows and the profess of the four vows. Finally, after a lifetime of total commitment to this monstrous system, they could be initiated, very few have ever made it, into the mysteries of the Jesuit order. What are those mysteries? I think we're going to find out tonight, folks. The ceremony of induction of the Jesuit is in the Library of Congress in the card of 6643354. It's an unbelievable admission to the world of what goes on in the initiation of a Jesuit into the profess. The Jesuit Orth, my son, you have been taught to act as a dissembler among the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants generally, be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence to speak, to seek to speak from their pulpits and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope. And even to descend so low as to become a Jew among the Jews that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, enjoying the blessing of peace to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected only that the church might be the gainer in the end and the condition fixed in the treaties for peace and that the end justifies the means you have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics facts and information in your power from every source to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of the Protestants and heretics of every class and character as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures and in the judiciaries and councils of state and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest. But you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner, as directed by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labor with the, with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war 
secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wounds of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate for ever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever they may, may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. Could they carry out these kinds of monstrous oaths? They can because of the secret of the exercises. In Bomer's book on the Jesuits, we read, we imbue into him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface. Sometimes after years of not even mentioning them and becomes so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow the irresistible impulse. Folks, you know what this is? It's possession. An army of possessed men dedicated to the destruction of all governments and religion in this world. We are told in the fiery Jesuits that at that time, 1667, secular persons of both sexes joined to the company by a resignation of themselves absolutely to the conduct of the professed fathers. These usually are gentlemen and merchants who enmix themselves in the court and city business and in offices, bargains and sales, or active gentlewomen and rich widows who, like a plantation of Indies, bring into the society a vault of revenue of gold and silver. Folks, even today, these societies joined to the Jesuits exist. This is the society of the Knights of Columbus. There is a women's side to that as well. And in this publication in 1950s in Life magazine, we see that the society is alive and powerful today. Now, this is the oath that the Knights of Columbus take. Again, this is from the congressional record. It's on file in, from February 15, 1913. And here it says, and I'm quoting from it, not all of it. Here we don't have time. I will place Catholic girls in Protestant families that a weekly report may be made of the inner movements of the heretics, that I will provide myself with arms and ammunition, that I may be in readiness when the word is passed or am commanded to defend the church either as an individual or with a militia of the Pope. This is in 1950s, folks, or 1913. In testimony hereof, I take this holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and witness the same further with my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy sacrament. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly and openly against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the face of the earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics. Open up the stomachs and wounds of the women and crush the infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race. Same as the Jesuit folks. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private. Should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow militia of the Pope cut off my hands and feet, cut my throat from ear to ear. May my belly be opened and sulfur burned therein with all the punishments that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my, my soul and my soul shall be tormented by demons in eternal hell forever. That I will in voting always vote for a Knight of Columbus in preference to a Protestant, especially a Mason. In the book Catholic Power Today we read that at this time, now, in the 1970s and 80s, the Catholic Church now has adopted simultaneously with carrying on the old traditional religious organization, a strategy of gradualness directed at the smooth identification of more, her most advanced weapons of penetration. Hence the creation of a peculiarly suited religious 
semi-religious, and even lay bodies whose aim is to infiltrate the various strata of society. The last few decades have seen the multiplication of such movements of penetration labeled secular institutes. Their members generally are people who, although laymen, have the same fervor and determination to fight for the church as have the traditional religious orders. Thus, while taking the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, they do not wear special clothes, have ordinary jobs, and mainly live at home. They avoid the spotlight and keep their membership a secret, not only from their own offices or factories, their co-workers and friends, but even from their own families. This termite-like secret army is a vast international. The growth of these semi-lay and lay orders whose members are unrecognizable even to Catholics themselves in these last day, in these last few decades has been phenomenal, particularly in Protestant England and the United States. Catholic Power Today, Arrow Manhattan, page 33. That's a book to get and study, folks. In 1773, the Jesuit order, due to the pressure of the governments of Europe, was put out of existence by the Pope. That Pope was poisoned because of that act. But the Jesuit order now no longer existed at that time. And so the Jesuits had to secularize themselves. Except in Russia, they continued unabated and controlled the government there. But Ingolstadt University had been a Jesuit center and institution for many, many years. Here in this institution, a young man, Adam Weishaupt, was a Jesuit-trained doctor of canon law. Now, he wanted to see the Jesuit order come back to power. And in time, he published a plan to take that organization and give them the world. This plan is laid out in a book called Proofs of Conspiracy by John Robeson in 1798, as well as many other books. Weishaupt had long been scheming the establishment of an association or order which in time should govern the world. In his first fervor and high expectations, he hinted to several ex-Jesuits the probability of their recovering under a new name the influence which they formerly possessed and of being again of great service to society by directing the education of youth of distinction now emancipated from all civil and religious prejudices. The order, he claimed, Weiss, Weishaupt claims in this book, the head of the order is Jesus of Nazareth, the grand master of our order. He appeared at a time when the world was in utmost disorder and among a people who for ages had grown under the yoke of bondage. He taught them the lessons of reason. To be more effective, he took in the aid of religion, of opinions were, which were current. And in a very clever manner, he combined his secret doctrines with the popular religion and with the customs which lay to his hand, he concealed the precious meaning and the consequences of his doctrine, but fully disclosed them to a chosen few. He's teaching that Christ was a master of the secret societies, that Jesus was the author of the system of communism and universal utopia. He claims this system would place men in a state of liberty and moral equality, that his new system would free them from the obstacles of subordination, rank, riches, continually thrown in their way, that all governments and religions would be destroyed. Our secret association works in a way that nothing can withstand, and man shall soon be free. Proofs of Conspiracy, page 64. It was Weishaupt who designed this pyramid structure as a symbol of how he would accomplish his goal. In the book Pawns and the Games by the... Uh, um, the Canadian commander, William Guy Carr, we see that the symbol that Adam Weiss helped design was an altarpiece there in Ingolstadt University. In the book, we read the significance of the design is as follows. The pyramid represents a conspiracy for the destruction of the Catholic Church, an establishment of a one world or UN dictatorship. The secret of the order of the eye radiated in all directions is the all-spying eye that symbolizes the terroristic Gestapo-like espionage agency that Weishaupt set up under the name of the insinuating brethren to guard the secret of the order and to terrorize the populace into acceptance of its rule. This Agpu had its first workout in the reign of terror of the French Revolution which it, which it was instrumental in organizing. Pawns in the Game by Guy Carr. What does Ellen White say about the power that took over the government of France? She says in Great Controversy, page 273, The beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. She says the atheistical power that ruled in France during the French Revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and His holy word as the world had never witnessed. 
They were the Jacobins, and Weishaupt was called the father of Jacobinism. So this new satanic power that rose up in the heart of the Jesuit order now became a power warring against the word of God to destroy all religions. In the book Pawns in the Game we read, it should be noted that this insignia acquired Masonic significance only after the merger of that order with the order of the Illuminati, Weishaupt's organization, in the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1782. So Masonry has been infiltrated by uh, the Illuminati. The picture of the eye in the pyramid can be found on books fomenting the ideas of Weishaupt which caused the French Revolution and what a horrible revolution it was. Ellen White says it prefigures an event to take place in this entire world. Human beings were slaughtered mercilessly at that time as God's spirit was withdrawn. The first power to suffer was the church and the heads of state. This was Louis XVI trying to flee the country and Marie Antoinette destroyed. When Jim and I went into East Berlin, we visited a museum there on communism. And there we found that one of their main displays in the history of communism was a display on the French Revolution as part of the origin of the communist movement in this world. In fact, the term communism comes from the French word commune, where this thing originated. In time, a man by the name of Lemney and then this man, Mazzini, became a leader in the world revolution, but not fully inducted into the secret orders. And he says, it says, research dug up letters from Mazzini which revealed how the high priests of the Luciferian creed keep their identity and true purpose secret. In a letter Mazzini wrote to his revolutionary associate, Dr. Bridenstine, only a few years before he died, he said, we form an association of brothers in all parts of the globe. We wish to break every yoke. Yet there is one unseen that can be hardly felt. Yet it weighs on us. Whence comes it? Where is it? No one knows. Or at least no one tells. This association is secret even to us, the veterans of the secret society, even to those involved in leading out in world revolutions, there was a secret society controlling them behind the scenes. This man took over after Mazzini. He was a commander in the, North, the southern armies. After the war, he settled down to study in Arkansas. And from there, this man with a tremendous mind became one of the world's most renowned authorities on pagan idolatry. He became the leader of the Illuminati in time. This that I'm about to read is a letter to the Palladian Council, written July 14, 1889, from Albert Pike. He, like Weishaupt, was the head of the Luciferian conspiracy in his day. Pawns in the Game by Guy Carr. And here is the letter. That which we say to the crowd is we worship God, but it is the God that one worships without superstition. The religion should be by all us initiates of the high degree maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai, the name they give the Christians, is God also, for the absolute can exist only as two gods. So they're saying that Jesus, or God, is both good and evil. And the good part of it, they're saying, is Lucifer, and the evil is Jesus Christ. Thus, the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. They don't believe in Satan. They believe that Jesus is evil, not Satan. And the true and pure philo philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Christ, or Adane, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adane, the God of darkness and evil, Albert Pike. Isn't that amazing what these people believe? They're worshipers of Lucifer. And friends, this is their plan. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, or the Nazis, he says here those who are working in favor of the Christian world, the atheists who are working against it. And we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clear to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity anxious for an ideal but without knowing where to render its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer finally out in public view a manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. They want another war, folks. It was Albert Pike who laid out the plan for three world wars. 
One, to open up Palestine. Two, to form a state in Palestine between the second and third, to raise the Arab world and the world of Israel. And once they were armed and ready, and the world was siding on one side or another, they would form an international war. And that war is on our horizon today. Ellen White told us in Evangelism, page 623, a power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. Those who are yielding to the passion for confederacy are working out the plans of the enemy. The cause will be followed by the effect. For a hundred years, we may have had the privilege of knowing what was going on in those secret societies through inspiration. An example of the kind of mind that exists in the spawn of the Jesuit order can be seen in this man, Aleister Crowley, who was a, a 33rd degree Mason. Aleister Crowley, 33rd degrees. Aleister Crowley was also a member of the Kabbalistic organization of the Golden Dawn in London. And here is his law. Do what thou will shall be the whole of the law. Every man and every woman is a star. Man has a right to live by his own law. Man has a right to eat what he will, drink what he will, dwell where he will, move where he will. Man has a right to, to think what he will, speak and write whatever he will and make what he will. Man has a right to love as he will. Take your fill and will of love, where and when you will. Man has a right to kill those who would thwart these rights. The slave shall serve. Do you like that law? It sure appeals to the carnal heart. And this law is spreading among the masses of the world today. It's the mind of Satan, folks. Secret Societies and Subversive Movements by Nesta Webster tells us that this conspiracy took place among the Jews. And I'm sure that much of it has taken a place in the Sanhedrin circles. But the fiery Jesuits describes clearly that the control of the money in this world is in the hands of the Roman Catholic Church today and especially in the hands of the Jesuits. They're the ones that claim to become the Jew among the Jews. They're leading out in the Zionist conspiracy. It was their interests that fomented the writing of the Communist Manifesto. It was their interests that financed this man to go in, Lenin, to go in and cause the revolution. The church was hoping to conquer the Eastern Orthodox Church. This revolution has not stopped. The communists may have left her in that revolution and took it for themselves. But the, the war continues today. January 4, 1862, Ellen White tells us, I was shown before Lincoln's administration, the former administration planned and managed for the South to rob the North of implements of war. They were contemplating a determined rebellion or revolution. The North did not understand the bitter, dreadful hatred of the South towards them and were unprepared for the deep laid plots. Volume 1 of the Testimonies, 253. What was behind these deep laid plots? In the book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Father Chiniqui, he tells us that he had hired Lincoln to be his lawyer uh, to protect him against a suit from the church. Lincoln was faithful and the man was gotten off. And this is a signature on the letter of the IOU found in the book of Lincoln. Listen to the words here. Dear Mr. Lincoln, I, answer, I answered, allow me to tell you that the joy I should naturally feel for such a victory is destroyed in my mind by the fear of what it may cost you. There were then in the crowd not less than 10 or 12 Jesuits from Chicago and St. Louis who came to hear my sins of condemnation to the penitentiary, but it was on their heads that you have brought the thunders of heaven and earth. Nothing can be compared to the expression of their rage against you when you not only wrenched me from their cruel hands, but you were making the walls of the courthouse tremble under the awful, superhumanly eloquent denunciation of their infamy, diabolical malice, and total want of Christian human principle in the plot they had formed for my destruction. What troubles my soul just now and draws tears to my eyes is that it seems to me that I have read your sentence of death in their fiendish eyes. How many other noble victims have fallen, have already fallen at their feet? Lincoln said, he looked at his watch after a talk with, with Father Chiniqui in his office in the White House, I am sorry that the 20 minutes I had consecrated our interview has all, almost passed away. I will be forever grateful for the warning words you have addressed to me about the dangers ahead of 
to my life from Rome. I know that they are not imaginary dangers. If I were fighting against a Protestant South as a nation, there would be no danger of assassination. The nations who read the Bible fight bravely on the battlefields, but they do not assassinate their enemies. The Pope and the Jesuits, with their infernal inquisition, are the only organized powers in the world which have recourse to the dagger of the assassin to murder those whom they cannot convince with their arguments or conquer with their sword. Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves than against the real American Protestants. Here again, we read from, uh, from the words of Abraham Lincoln, those antisocial laws today are written on her banners with blood of 10 million of martyrs. It is under those bloody banners that 6,000 Roman Catholic priests, Jesuits, and bishops in the United States are marching to the conquest of this republic, backed by their seven millions of blind and obedient slaves. Those laws, which are still the ruling laws of Rome, were the main cause of the last rebellion of the southern states. Yes, without Romanism, the last awful civil war would, would have been impossible. Jeff Davis would never have dared to attack the North had he not had assurance from the Pope that the Jesuits, the bishops, the priests, and the whole people of the Church of Rome, under the, under the name Mask of Democracy, would help him. These diabolical anti-social laws of Rome caused the Roman Catholic beer guard to be the man chosen to fire the first gun at Fort Sumter. It is not, is it not an absolute absurdity, says Lincoln, to give to a man a thing which he has sworn to hate, curse, and destroy? And does not the Church of Rome hate, curse, and destroy liberty of conscience when she can do, she can do it safely? I am for liberty of conscience in the noblest, broadest, highest sense, but I cannot give liberty of conscience to the Pope and to his followers, the papists, so long as they tell me through their councils, theologians, and canon laws that their conscience orders them to burn my wife, strangle my children, and cut my throat when they find their opportunity. This does not seem to be understood by the people today. But sooner or later, the light of common sense will make it clear to everyone that no liberty of conscience can be granted to men who are sworn to obey the Pope, who pretends to have the right to put to death those who differ from him in religion. He says the common people see and hear the big noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy cars. They call them Jeff Davis, Lee, Toombs, Beauregard, Simmons. And they honestly think that they are the motive power, the first cause of our troubles. But this is a mistake, says Lincoln. The true motive power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the colleges, schools of the Jesuits, the, conv the convents, nuns, and the confessional boxes of Rome. There is a fact which is too much ignored by the American people and with which I am acquainted only since I became a president. It is that the best, the leading families of the South have received their educated in great part, if not in whole, from the Jesuits and the nuns. Now, after the assassination of Lincoln, uh, this brother, Chiniqui, is, is talking in the book. After I mixed my tears with those of the grand country of my adoption, I fell on my knees and asked my God to grant me to show to the world what I knew to be the truth, that that horrible crime was the work of popery. And after 20 years of constant and most difficult researches, I came fearlessly today before the American people to say and prove that the President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by the priests and Jesuits of Rome. In the, po in the book of the testimonies given in the prosecution of the assassin of Lincoln published by Ben Pittman and in the two volumes of the trial of John Surratt in 1867, we have the legal and irrefutable proof that the plot of the assassins of Lincoln was matured if not started in the house of Mary Surratt. But who were living in the house at that time? The legal answer is the most devout Catholics in the city. The sworn testimonies show more than that. They show that it was the common rendezvous of the priests of Washington. These people were Roman Catholics. It was a Jesuit conspiracy that destroyed Abraham Lincoln. The church planned the destruction of the world and the regaining of its power through world wars. And this is brought out in this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. She tried with Bismarck to get him to fight for her, to Kaiser Wilhelm to get him to fight for her. And in time, she brought about the reaction of the Serbians against her effort to force them to Catholicism, an assassination attempt on one behind the Catholic plot. And that led to the, war, the, the first great war, the first world war. In time, this man, Pius XI, brought to power Mussolini in the desire to regain some political power. 
In time, in 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed, and the church was given money and some land. But more than that, prestige again among the nations, and Mussolini was raised to power in Italy. In this book, The Destruction of Freemasonry Through a Revelation of Her Secrets, by General Eric Ludendorff, he brings irrefutable evidence, the evidence of court records before us in that book, that in Germany, in the, court, in the secret societies, the Andrean Mason Lodges there, they were planning on using the German people as a takeoff point for a war. What was the purpose behind that war? We discover it clearly. This is the Nuncio Pacelli from the Vatican to Bavaria. There in Bavaria, he worked secretly with von Papen, and in time they signed a court concordat between Hitler and the Vatican. Hitler was raised to power by the Roman Church. It was his relationship with them that made him the man. Speeches. His Mein Kampf were written by Jesuits, and he became a god in that age. And also as the secret mechanisms of Roman Catholic subversion were taking place in the international world, we find that the IG Farben drug complex and the Rockefeller dynasty merged and formed the wealthiest and most powerful cartel in the world. And it was through them that Hitler was financed and brought to power. Hitler's rise to power would have been impossible without the secret financial support of IG Farben. The Nazi state became the means by which the cartel agreements were enforced. This is from the book World Without Cancer, page 286 and 287. Hitler himself stated, I learned much from the order of the Jesuits. Until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party. Isn't that an amazing thing to say? This man, Himmler, was the head of the SS. But friends, his uncle, Himmler, was a Jesuit from oath and induction from the Beria of University uh, the, 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 from the Bavarian court. The SS troops were a Jesuit-controlled society, and they became the police of the Nazi state. This book, Spoke, Smoke Screens, reveals a tremendous... Uh, involvement of the Roman Catholic Church in the slaughter of millions of people. Here it quotes Hitler as saying, as for the Jews, I am just carrying on with the same policy which the Catholic Church has adopted for 1,500 years. Franz von Papen is quoted as saying again in that book, Smoke Screens, page 20, by Jack Chick, the Third Reich is the first willpower which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. What are the high principles of the papacy? What, what is the plan that the Jewish church has for its enemies. You can see it in the faces of the people in the concentration camps. That nuncio that worked secretly with von Papen became the Pope after Pius XI. Now Pope Pius XII. Supporting Hitler, but in time he saw Hitler's power waning. He was just using Hitler. And in time he turned his attention to the Western world. But what was happening in another country in Europe? Antip Bevelek. The head of the Ustachi state of Croatia, surrounded with Croatian Catholic clergy in April 1942, he was to Yugoslavia what Hitler was to Germany. There in that state, priests became soldiers, and they worked at the most horrible suffering and slaughter and persecution that the world has ever seen from the time of the Dark Ages. People were tortured to death with spoons and knives and forks, forced to eat their relatives. Eyes were torn out of the sockets and wreathed and handed out among the priests. This is 1942, folks. It shows that if she gains power, she will return to the apostasies of the ancient time. This man was responsible for opening up trade with Russia and recognizing a political connection with Rome. He also placed this Masonic symbol on our dollar. Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order. The reverse of the seal of the United States of America, according to Manley P. Hall, an expert on Masonic law, not only were many of the founders of the U.S. government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe which helped them to establish the United States for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The great seal, says Hall, was a signature of this exalted body, and the unfinished pyramid on its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task through the accomplishment of which the U.S. government was dedicated from the day of its inception. Who dedicated this country? Many books have been published now that make it clear what took place during the years after the Second World War. 
First, the church joined itself to the United States through Cardinal Spellman. Then, Russia, realizing the responsibility that the church had in the Russian Revolution, realized that the entire balance of world power could be swayed by being involved in Vatican politics. So a Catholic post now, Pope, now, in 1958, comes to the throne in the Vatican. And what does he do? He establishes the great Vatican Council for bringing the governments and the churches of the world into great communist society. They invited priests and, and uh, 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 the reverends and religious leaders from all over to join in their talks. What was happening here was an effort to unite the world and paralyze her enemy. In Catholic Power Today by Aver Manhattan we read, the Catholic Church's offer for reunion to all Christian churches not in communion with her is a magnificent ecclesiastical Trojan horse, a means to penetrate their citadels and accomplish their capture and final capitulation. Catholic Power Today, page 22. And this is how she plans to do it. She will support any military or economic force or movement that would maintain things while she is in power. If she can't accomplish it that way, she'll mobilize her religious and diplomatic power to counteract against her opponent in the event she fails to crush it another way. But finally, her last bid is forming an alliance with it, characterizing her joining it in, a spe in special circumstances, even leading it as she's doing today in the great movement for peace and disarmament in the world and the ecumenical movement. This is one of her last assaults. She led out in the charismatic movement secretly and in time as it passed the borders of the Catholic Church and Protestants saw that now the Catholic Church was speaking in tongues. These are Catholic priests. Catholics and Protestants together in great revival meetings will be speaking in tongues together. Some of these folks will be speaking in rosaries while the others beside them are speaking in, uh, in tongues. It seems to adapt itself to every religious climate today. Spiritualism has joined Christianity. It was this pope, the next pope to take office, Paul VI, that took over the world in a great movement of ecumenism. He finished up the work of the Vatican II. Here he is uniting himself with the Greek Orthodox Church. And we find that today, because of the great uh, ecumenical movement that was begun and is sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestants are paralyzed. They no longer speak out against Rome. This man here is Walter Martin, Dr. Walter Martin. Supposedly, he's a, a great man in the evangelical circles. He accuses the Seventh-day Adventist Church of being a cult because they claim Ellen White is a pope or, or they take Ellen White, he says, as a pope. And yet, he will not call the Catholic Church a cult. He says she's a Christian church today. What is happening to the Protestant world? It was the Catholic Church that opened up her doors and invited the communist heads of state in. Here's President Tito from Yugoslavia in uh, meeting with the pope at the Vatican. Pope Paul VI became the communist pope, the pope of the proletariat, mingling among the workers in the various areas of the world. They even devised an entirely new image of Jesus for the populaces now in the Marxist Catholic system. Jesus was depicted as a white-collar worker, and posters were put in the factories of the third world countries. In other places, <clears throat> Jesus was depicted as having overalls or with tools in his hands. Christ was now that God that many years before Adam Weiss helped had pointed out that he was. In 1973, this magazine came out on the Jesuits. Here it made it appear that the Jesuit order was in search of a new identity, that they didn't know what they wanted to do, that they were in a state of flux. It shows the Jesuit priests as common, everyday, dressed people. <clears throat> but still, it showed that Jesuits are involved in the various activities of missionary endeavors all over the world. Some, like Nixon, Abe McLaughlin, are in politics, movie actor O'Malley, and here are Congressman Drennan at the Capitol. This is a Jesuit priest named Dan Lyons, and a book by John D. McCullum. 
Here it pointed out that Dan Lyons was an expert on Asiatic affairs and counseled Richard Nixon. It was his counsel to bomb Cambodia that Richard Nixon followed. Here he is with uh, Commander Abrams working in, in, uh, in Vietnam. How far have these men gone? What secret mechanisms are even being worked out still today in politics, in religion, and all over the world? They make us feel like they're looking for a new identity. But friends, they know exactly what they're doing in the great world revolution that's taking place today. This man, the head of the FBI, made it very clear that the communists are deliberately maneuvering among the Negroes to create a situation for outbreak of racial violence to such an extent that it can be turned into a civil war, a civil war on a racial basis. In such a civil war, should they succeed in fomenting it, the communists hope to so undermine the American government and our social structure that they can take over power. In the racial civil war that they envisage, they are sure the Negroes will be in the front ranks, the shock troops of the communist revolution. This is quoted from a congressional record, August 7, 1963. Brethren, the spirit of prophecy tells us, and I don't have the quote or the source of the quote now, it's in the white states, but that again, there'll be a racial movement, the army will be called out to put it down, and men will go back into servitude. And the result of it will be a Sunday law. Friends, we're seeing a fulfillment of the spirit of prophecy's prophecy taking place today. In this book, the Negroes in the Soviet America, written by a communist, published in the South, encouraged the Negro people to rise up and form their own country in the South. And that under communism, they would be exalted to a much higher position in society. This is a communist class that was held in the South. And as you notice on the far right-hand corner, you see that is Martin Luther King, a communist being trained to carry on this revolution. And I want you to know right now still that the revolution, communist revolution, the spearhead of it, is the Jesuits in the Roman Catholic Church. I'll prove that to you in a minute. Here he is with known card-holding communists from the conspiracy that took place in Hollywood. Beside him, Sidney Poitier and Harry Balafonte. Violence is being planned today, brethren. I was down in, uh, at the flea market, down in the city, and there uh, a man came up to the table, he heard me talking about prophecy with someone else, and he said, would you tell me something? He said, would you please tell me why the black folks down here in the city are hoarding automatic weapons. Just down the street from me, I saw a van pull up, and they unloaded boxes of automatic weapons into a garage. What is happening? What are they planning? Brethren, I don't know how long until this, the cities are a hotbed of violence because of these type of plans. But it's coming, and Ellen White tells us that it's going to be an overwhelming persecution, relentless in its fury. The Catholic Church is involved in this uh, ethnic ac action publicly. In Africa, she is making the black prelates the only prelates there. So the church will relate to a black church at that point. This gentleman, Pope John Paul I, was in for only 33 days. The reason for this gentleman coming in for only 33 days is that he was the choice of the communist influence. The church had become fearful that Moscow would dominate the church, that she would take over it. Prelates began to move. They worked with the CIA. Cardinal Wyszynski from Poland was summoned to this secret meeting, and they decided to plan to get Wotila in. Wotilla had already been deeply involved in the Vatican II project. He was an extremely intelligent man, and he was trained in the field of acting and playwriting. He was the perfect man for the job. He was a Marxist, but he was an anti-Moscow Marxist. And he would be perfect for developing the new brand of Lenin Christianity that they believed was the new age in this world. 
John Paul in the liberal magazines in this country, which we know are controlled by the elements that are involved in world conspiracy, set him up as a superstar. 14,000 journalists were accredited to cover his passage through this country. Millions and millions of dollars have been used to place this man in a campaign as a god among the nations today. And the Protestants, where are they? They're completely paralyzed. Protestants for the Pope. <clears throat> we see that a Protestant Baptist president invited the Pope to do the Mass on the White House lawns. He was invited before the United Nations. Here he is with Kurt Waldheim, the secretary at that time. And there before the United Nations, he revealed his Marxist beliefs. The Plain Truth magazine put out in that year says that during the 62-minute discourse at the General Assembly, the Pope shed, as it were, his clerical garb and displayed his humanistic side. He interposed his carefully chosen words with patently Marxist egalitarian themes. Murray Kempton of the New York Post said, the Pope aligned himself in spirit with the demands of the developing nations for the restructuring of the world economic order. That's a tremendous statement. And look what's going on in black Africa. When the Pope visited Africa, they even changed the color of Christ. There, when the Pope got back from the meetings there in Africa, he said that Catholicism in Africa is Africa. The church is taking over the third world communist countries today. Prelates are now all of an ethnic nature and in time there is a hope and a plan that a man of an ethnic nature will become the Pope and thus the third world, the largest part of our world as far as the masses of mankind will identify with the Vatican. Today this Pope has brought this uh, man, Gantian, into a promotional position second in line to the papal seat. We read here that during the papal visit to Benin two years ago, it was Gantian who received the most rousing cheers from one welcoming crowd. John Paul's increasing trust in his African aid was acknowledged last week when Gantin, in a major reshuffle of the papal staff, was promoted to one of these most important posts in the Vatican. As he went to Central America, here he lent his speeches to the communist revolution that were taking place there. The, parable, the peril of such interpretation is portentous. It puts the kingdom of God in the near future just beyond the fast approaching Catholic Marxist revolution. The spirit of these biblical Marxist Leninist oriented quotations has already impregnate, impregnated the whole fabric of the Latin American church. From Tierra del Fuego to the borders of the U.S. scattered all along the continent, there are, under, there are undetermined battalions of missionary priests, nuns, lay workers, preaching and practicing a combination of the tenets of liberation theology and the neo-Marxian Catholic Catholicism of Pope John Paul II. Brethren, there's a revolution moving towards our, our, our borders today. Their commanders, as a rule, were and are the Jesuits or Jesuit-inspired priests or lay workers, something which Pope John Paul II discovered to his astonishment when the U.S. intelligence apparatus denounced them as the main instigators of the guerrilla opposition, guerrilla's opposition mostly against Latin American administration, financed and militarily supported by the U.S. Individual Jesuit at times acknowledged their involvement in the revolution. Father Louis Pelisser, for instance, when he testified in San Salvador, December 12, 1981, before an audience of diplomats and newsmen, admitted that he had served an active guerrilla group for almost 15 years. That's clear back to, at this point, when this was published, that would be clear back from 1965. They have been leading out in the communist revolution of Central America. He stated that he had joined the guerrillas in Guatemala, and from there he had helped to prepare the ground for the guerrillas in El Salvador. Every Jesuit in Central America, he commented, is actively serving God, not God, but Marxism and revolution. 
That is from the book, The Vatican Washington Moscow Alliance by Avril Manhattan. Get it, brethren, and read that book and be aware of the rise of Catholicism today in politics. As we visited the ancient center of the Waldensian religion in Torre Police, we were disappointed there for three days. The, these uh, former Christians, now still calling themselves Waldenses and the Catholics, were carrying on a communist rally for three days called Il Unita, singing Marxist uh, hymns, and you can see the, the, uh, the sickle and the hammer there as their symbol. Christians! have become communists in this world and it's the biggest movement taking place. In the countries that Jim and I pass through in our traveling, we're constantly faced with this type of thing. Clear out on the island of Patmos, they were having a communist Christian rally there, the Greek Orthodox Church. Brethren, we are not aware of what's taking place. We have been blind for too long. This Pope has captured the hearts of the world. The world is now wondering after the beast. If there is any time, the healing of the wound is taking place now. And friends, the power, once it is gained again, will result in mass persecution. President Reagan recognizes the power of the Roman papacy and that 25% of the American populace is Roman Catholic in votes. Adam Manhattan's book, Catholic Power Today, page 129, tells us the Catholic Church is the largest church in the United States of America. Ecclesiastically, she is the best organized. Financially, she is on a par with any of the giant trusts or corporations of America. Indeed, should the occasion arise, she could stand up to all of them collectively. Politically, she is looming ever larger at the White House. She's a power in the Senate, a force, the Pentagon, an invisible agent at the FBI and the most subtly intangible prime mover of the wheel within the wheel of the United States of America, the Central Intelligence Agency. This again, Avril Manhattan's book, page 129. There is a reason why Ronald Reagan is behind something that the American people were shocked about. A U.S. and Vatican forming a link. Here we find that it was uh, it wasn't the last official Vatican ambassador was in 1867. And remember that during this time there was a revolution taking place in Italy. The Pope was moved out of his political position and there was confusion brought in. But America had not fully forgotten the responsibility of the Roman Catholic Church in the war between the states. For all this time, for 117 years, we have held off our connection with that power. And now, U.S. Vatican re resumes full diplomatic ties. What does it say? The step announced here at the Vatican was described by officials of the Reagan administration as an attempt to improve communications at a time when Pope John Paul has become increasingly involved in international affairs. What's happening in our affairs here in the United States? The Protestants have been consistently moving into the arena of politics. There is a revival of religion in legislature today. Many of the old concepts that were revived before, men have forgotten that they were religious. A one-world judicial court was fomented by the National Federation of Churches, the National Council of Churches. Social Security was a religious issue. And now many religious issues are covering the, the, the books of law today. What's going to happen as a president in this country has to capitulate to the religious forces? We read on April 23, 1984, in Spotlight magazine, Reagan orders concentration camps. Mass detention facilities, otherwise known as concentration camps, are being set up at a number of major U.S. military installations on the secret orders of President Ronald Reagan. The spotlight has learned that on April 5, the White House issued a highly classified national security decision. The first roundup and publicly announced one will be of illegal aliens and refugees. A military source told Spotlight, but under the secret provisions of Rex 84, there will be also broad arrests of security suspects who can be held in these centers under this emergency order, whether they're U.S. citizens or not. And this is the thing that alarms me. 
It says, according to these sources, the primary goal of the vast police operation condemned by Rex 84 is to detain and deport illegal immigrants. But these sources say Rex 84 has another, even more closely guarded and carefully orchestrated objective. To apply the so-called capture and custody measures against political opponents, resistors, or even outspoken critics whom the administration considers dangerous. We know that recently, President Reagan met with the Pope in Alaska. And there, he assured the Pope that we would become involved in world projects with the Roman Catholic Church. What if our country, our legislature, becomes so increasingly involved with religion and politics that it recognizes the message of God through the Adventist people as a challenge to that power? We'll be put in concentration camps. Ellen White tells us in Great Controversy, page 564 and 571, let the restraints that are imposed by secular governments be removed, and Rome be reinstated in her former power, and there would speedily be a revival of her former tyranny and persecution. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Protestant church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world. To reestablish persecution and to undo all that Protestantism has done. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held by her. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the invariable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Folks, it doesn't make any difference what face she presents before the world. It could be claiming to forgive her assassin. It could be claiming to feed the poor. It could be anything, but God has shown us under inspiration that the plan is to paralyze mankind into not seeing her as dangerous when she plans their destruction. The churches in this world <clears throat> The spirit of prophecy tells us still house beneath them dungeons. Places where in the past torture was carried out and implements of torture. And we understand again by the spirit of prophecy that those tortures will be resumed again whenever she has her opportunity. Brethren, we face a serious decision we face a having to give up our life in this world to do God's will. Every major destroying movement from the turn of the century and even before the great wars were an effort by this demonic power to regain possession of the entire world. And brethren, the piece of cake today is much bigger than it has ever been before. If she could ride upon the nations and control them, she would never again fall. And she believes that she'll do that. In Revelation, we read that she says, I sit a queen. And she doesn't believe that she'll ever see that sorrow again. How will she accomplish it in this age? I'd like to read to you from Education by Ellen G. White, page 227 and 228. Spiritualism asserts that men are unfallen demagogues, that each mind will judge itself, that true knowledge places men above all law, that all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is, is right, and God doth not condemn. Brethren, this is the teachings of the occult world. These were the teachings that Adam Weiss helped, and his co-conspirator Jesuits and others that were brought into the Luciferian conspiracy taught that brought about the destruction of France and the revolution spreading to the world. At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine but human. The centralizing of wealth and power, is that happening today? 
The vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. The combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims. Brother, everything from terrorism to the man walking down the street with a poster is that movement today. The spirit of unrest, of riot, and bloodshed. The worldwide disseminations of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Brethren, there is a movement today. The base of it is spiritualism. People are crying human rights again and the movements of Christianity are right involved in those cries. In Revelation 17, verse 8, we read about this movement. The beast that thou sought, sawest, was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. This is the same source of the beast of Revelation, chapter 11, which the spirit of prophecy tells us was the atheistical, spiritualistic power that controlled the government of France. Today, it's rising on the scenes. And... Ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall what? Hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. The very power that she wants to ride upon, the very power that she feels is going to set her up above the nations, is the very power secretly that is working for her complete destruction. And brethren, her destruction is not just the destruction of the Catholic Church, but she is the mother and the harlots are the Protestant world. And all of Christianity is going to be involved in a tremendous war and a slaughter at the hands of the new spiritualistic movement that is taking place today. <clears throat> Ancient spiritualism had to work in secret and was a novelty to many people for many years. But recently it has become the fastest growing movement in the world. Since 1976 and 77, the teachings of witchcraft have become the predominant religion in the world today. In this book by Marilyn Ferguson, The Aquarian and Conspiracy, we are taught that in this day and age, the greatest minds, the most powerful people in the world, and people on the grass level are organizing. They're working together, though maybe unseen, in legislative halls and in schools, in Christian churches. They are working together to bring about a great occult revival and a taking over of the world in this new age. And folks, they have control of the wealth. They have control of the scientific secrets. There is nothing that they cannot accomplish when their word says go, except that God is holding back the winds. These people can control your mind and control your heart. Ellen White tells us that Satan will work through the sciences of psychology, phrenology, and animal me mesmerism. He will use hypnotism on the masses at the end of time. Where is our protection against this great final effort? Brethren, it's only that we are possessed entirely by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We could not expect to escape the delusion that's coming and the overpowering delusion of Satan as long as one part of our being is still on Satan's ground. We have got to come up to the fullness of Christ's righteousness. Christ has to come into his heart as we read in Desire of Ages, page 324. He'll come in and he'll make our heart his possession and he'll make it his fortification to determine no power should be known in it but his own. And he will make that heart impregnable to the assaults of Satan. At some point in the experience of the Adventist people, we've got to face the fact that we have to settle into the truth of justification so that we can no longer be moved. And God can end this work. This mind of Ignatius Loyola is the dark, vile mind of the Dark Ages. And yet, through the initiation and through the exercises of Loyola, that mind from the Dark Ages of papal supremacy controls the most brilliant minds in the world today. And science, Ellen White tells us, is to lead the world into the papacy 
as superstition and ignorance once led it into the papacy in the years before. Their schools and their universities cover the world, and in the United States they're everywhere. Thousands of Jesuits continue to graduate every year, and now the people have no knowledge of what their plans are for the world. Uh, brethren, I believe that we are unconquerable if we are part of the movement of the Holy Spirit in this last age. But if you are not, and you don't know for sure that your salvation is secure at this time, you will not be able to stand the pressures that are coming. We know that if we are faithful to our calling, that through us and through other means, God will be able to pluck brands from the burning that were foremost in the cause of Satan at the end of time. And one of these brands was a man by Lacunza, a Chilean Jesuit. This is Lambeth Palace in London, and there's a library there that's set up for priests and prelates. Jim and I, through, I believe, a miracle of God, were allowed to go in there and study, and there were priests and nuns around us. We asked the librarian to find us these two books, plus a book by John Darby. These books about the coming of Christ were written by a Chilean Jesuit, La Cunza, finding his way in the 18th century to the Bible. He studied it. Probably as a man entranced, he began to understand the nearness of Jesus' coming. And so he began to write. He went through all of the doctrines of that time on the coming of Christ and proved them all false. And when he did present his view of the coming of Christ, you know what he presented? He presented the truth that Jesus Christ was soon coming to take his saints from this earth. That he would take them up with him into the heavens and there they would reign with Christ for a thousand years. After this period of time when all are destroyed on this earth, he would come back with them after the millennium and he would judge all the wicked, raising them from hell and from the dead. Of course, he didn't fully understand the immortality of the soul and some of our doctrines, but brethren, the publication of these books in the 1820s and 30s led to the great revival in England and the looking forward to Jesus coming. I believe that these men, many of them, and others that are involved in, in movements that they believe is right can be one if our people will wake up and do the work God has called them to do. <clears throat> there are safety measures in the Bible to avoid their influence on us and on our churches. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, we read, But though we who are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, unto you, let him be cursed or damned. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed or damned. If we followed the Bible, we would not allow heresy in our ranks. And a great suffering would be saved for many of the people of God. In 2 John, verse 9, we read, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what is it? The everlasting gospel of three angels' messages that were delivered to the Adventist people. Receive him not into your house, not into your place of worship and neither bid him Godspeed or you'll be a partaker of his evil deeds. How many men, how many times have we allowed ourselves to be subjected to reasoning that has destroyed the Adventist faith? Jesus now is a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. There he waits to finish his work in you and in I. Christ is the one that holds his angels in his hands. That's a symbol of all his people that are faithful to him, giving his message. He holds them there. They're in his hand and no one can take them out. Christ the sacrifice is beside each one of us today through the ministration of our high priest. As he ministers his Holy Spirit to us, the death of Christ becomes our death. The world is sacrificed unto us and we unto the world. And Christ's eternal life is given to us.
We can stand in this world as conquerors over self and live without sin, brethren. The power is there for us. Christ is pictured in Revelation chapter 3 in the Laodicean message is knocking at the door of your heart. Brethren, Jesus longs for you to open up the faculties of your soul. Lay aside the thoughts and the concepts of this world and let Jesus take all of your thought. Behold Him. And the Bible promises that you'll be transformed into the same image. Christ today is calling for His children. He's going to bring them into a powerful movement. And if we're faithful to that calling, there is no power in this world that can stand against us. Every obstacle will be broken in our path. And God's glorious message will go to the world. Brethren, the Lord is going to work in simple ways. He can take anybody and speak through him just as he can talk to a stone or as he talked to a donkey at the time of Balaam. Brethren, if he can talk through a donkey, he can talk through you. And you know the message that he has to give? He wants you to speak for him and invite the people in this world home. He wants you to tell them to prepare to meet their God who's coming soon. Brethren, we haven't any idea of the glories of the heavenly home. We can't imagine it. But the Holy Spirit wants us to know that God has prepared things above our greatest imagination. And there is nothing in this world that should keep you from receiving that prize. Not all the power of the Jesuits or the Catholic Church or the great communist movement. None of these things should keep you from Him. Not the worldliness, not the, the money, not family, not structure, not church, not anything. Just Jesus. And He can bring you in. And He can seal you for eternity. Let's have prayer together, shall we? Our dear and gracious God, you have opened up to the minds of this people the wonderful, wonderful truths of the great controversy. Dear Lord, help us to be faithful to the knowledge that you have given to us. Give us the strength, O oh Lord, to stand for thee, for the right though the heavens fall. Not only to be ready for your coming, but to bring hundreds and thousands of others into the fold now in these closing moments. Lord, we know by the signs of the times that it's almost over. I pray for each soul that hears this tape. And I ask that thy angels should convict, and the Holy Spirit should convict their hearts of the need to total conviction now.